good to be here this morning. We want to welcome each one, especially those visiting with us on a beautiful Sunday. Thank you for a week of vacation. It was good to go see our, our daughter and grandchildren. Uh, it's good to be back. Beautiful weather. And this evening we look forward to a request program here, and you're each welcome to come to that. Offering will be taken for New Hope, South of Platt, the Bible camp there. And we look forward to, on Wednesday, um, afternoon, evening, having the carnival here, and thank you for all the work that you put in for that. But it's good to be here to worship this morning. We want to remember Dal Kruger in our prayers. Um, he's going to be hospitalized tomorrow, having some tests in Parkston. In our prayers. For our call to worship this morning, we turn to Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation your works to another. They tell my, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. And we begin our worship this morning by singing number 12, Praise Him, Praise Him. Our God greets us this morning in these words, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, his only Son, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us respond to our God by singing, I love you, Lord, number 78.
people who love our God, let's take a moment and greet those around us this morning.
one line struck me in that last song that we sang. God looks on him and the sacrifice that he made and pardons us. And how blessed we are that Jesus paid the sacrifice for us, that we can be called children of God. And this morning we focus on what Christ has done for us and we turn to contemporary testimony, our world belongs to God section focusing on Christ. God remembered his promise to reconcile the world to himself. He has come among us in Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh. He is a long way to save. In the events of his earthly life, his temptations and suffering, his teaching and miracles, his battle with demons and talks with sinners. As the second Adam, he chose the path we had rejected.
as our substitute, he suffered all his years on earth, especially in the horrible torture of the cross. He walked out of the grave, the Lord of life. He conquered sin and death. Being both God and man, Jesus is the only mediator between God and his people. In him, the Father chose those whom he would save. Jesus ascended in triumph to his heavenly throne. And that's why we've come here this morning. It's to take refuge in our God. We don't take confidence in ourselves, but in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And sometimes we wonder how we should pray, and yet we know Jesus hears our prayers and presents them before the Father. So let us go this morning to our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this day, a day that you have made, a day in which we can rejoice and be glad. We thank you that we can come as your people to worship and praise you, and that you accept that praise because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We thank you that you hear our prayers because of what he's done for us. And Lord, we often take it so for granted. And Lord, we ask that you will be merciful to us and be gracious to us, that you hear our prayers and that you forgive our sins. Lord, we, we thank you for the privilege of being your people. And we pray for those who are not able to be with us this morning, for those who have special needs and concerns, and we ask, Lord, that you will bless them. Lord, we, we pray that you will especially be with Dal as he goes and is hospitalized tomorrow and has tests done. We pray that they may find what his difficulties are and that they may be able to treat him accordingly. Lord, we thank you for the gift of modern medicine. And yet, Lord, we know it is you who heals. And Lord, we know that each of us have a time in which we can live on this earth. And we thank you that because of your love shown to us in Jesus Christ, we have an eternity awaiting us. And Lord, help us to be people who focus on you and what you've done for us as we live our lives here, to be a blessing to those around us and to give praise to you. Lord, we thank you for this country in which we live. We thank you for the freedoms which we enjoy and we ask that you will be with those who make decisions concerning our government and we ask, Lord, that you will give them hearts that seek to do your will. And may each of us have hearts that seek to do your will. We pray that you will be with those who give their lives to protect this country, and we ask that you will watch over and protect them. And not them only, but we pray for all the nations of this world. We pray especially at this time for the nation of Israel and the conflict in which they are in. And we ask, Lord, that your will may be done there, and that lives may be spared, and that people may look to you. Lord, we pray that you will be with your missionaries, as they carry your word in difficult places. And we pray that as your word goes out, that it may touch the lives of boys and girls, men and women, and that people might be drawn to you through this nation and around the world. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of your spirit, which help us to understand it. And we ask this morning that as we look at your word, that you will speak to our hearts through it, and that we may have a greater appreciation of what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will be with the children as they continue through school to the end of the year. 
We ask that you give them a desire to learn and give them an enthusiasm for that time in their life. We pray that you'll be with teachers too as they teach. And we ask, Lord, that the children might be blessed as they develop their gifts to use for you. Lord, we anticipate to a planting season. And we thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather. We thank you for moisture. Thank you for sunshine. We thank you that we can know that you are in control. And as we approach this time, we ask, Lord, that you give us a sense of peace and also a desire to do the tasks that you've set before us to honor and glorify you. We ask now that you'll be with us as we continue to worship. We ask that you'll be with us in this week that lies ahead. We pray that you'll be with the request program this evening, the carnival on Wednesday, And we ask, Lord, that you might be praised through those events as well and that your people might be blessed. We ask this in Jesus' name. At this time, we ask the children to come forward for our children's message. It's good to see you all here this morning. It looks like you're doing well and your your parents take good care of you. They even train older brothers and sisters to take care of younger ones. That's good. Um, your moms and dads feed you every day? They do. Um, do you have a favorite food that you like? Some of you, what do you like? You like pizza. Um, Anyone else have something that they like? Mac and cheese. What's that? Brats. Brats. Yes, brats, of course. Uh, Why didn't I think of that? Anything else? Ice cream, yes. Cheese, yeah. There's lots of good foods. Any of you like Cheese brats, yeah. <laughs> You're combining it, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Do any of you like candy bars? Yeah, you like candy bars? Um, let's just say you really liked candy bars and wanted candy bars every day for every meal. Um, different kind of candy bars. Do you think your mom and dad would give that to you? Why not? It's not healthy? No, it's not. It wouldn't be good for you. Um, And your moms and dads want you to grow up healthy. So they give you healthy foods. They give you a variety of foods. And there's lots of good foods. And you think especially when you're a baby, your moms and dads don't just give you candy all the time. They, first of all, give you milk. um, The most essential food for you at that time. And it's good for your bones. It's good for your teeth. To have that in your diet all the time, that's why they serve milk in school, too. Um, and we think about our lives as we grow in knowledge. And there's a whole wealth of things that we can feed our brains on TV, on the Internet, and there's books we can read. And it's good to fill our minds with good things. And we think of God's Word, and it's the most important thing. And so your moms and dads want you to learn God's word, and you learn that here um, at church. Um, You do memory verses, and you go to Sunday school and catechism to learn God's word for you so that you can grow in faith and knowledge of what's most important. And so this morning, I, I didn't bring candy for you, but I did meet some of your requests. I brought cheese made from milk, which is good for your, good for your teeth, good for your bones. You are welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Any of you allergic to cheese? 
or milk dairy products? I don't see anybody. I have a granddaughter, Biz, so that's why I asked. I brought something else in case. I also used to have a little boy who I'd hand it out and he'd say, I don't like cheese. And his dad would say, just keep giving it to him. He said, I like it. <laughs> and so if you don't like cheese, find somebody who does and share it with them. Thanks for coming up this morning. For our scripture this morning, we turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 21, the last chapter of John. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, it happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. That night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, Son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, 
Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that not even the whole world would have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. And may God add his blessing to it. I'd like to begin with a quote, and you see if you can tell me who it comes from. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other place. Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Yes, Charles Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities. And Charles Dickens was known as being a literary genius. He was extremely smart. And his reflection on life is something that we can take to heart. We think about our lives. Think about the best time of your life when it was. If you would go, could go to a certain time of your life, what would it be? Some of us think of our childhood. And our childhood was so innocent. Everything seemed like it was taken care of. We think of our teenage years, and we think of the excitement that we enjoyed. Some of us think of perhaps the first year or two you got married, and the joy you experienced with that, or your children being born, and the excitement of that. Some of you think of celebrating a certain anniversary, going on a certain vacation. But in all those times, the good that there was, there's always difficulty, is there not? And we think about the worst of times of our life, a time we wished we'd never had to live through. And even in those times, there is good, is there not? because we see the graciousness of our God in those times. We think of Jesus' life here on earth. His coming to be born, and we say it is great that Jesus came to be born, and yet for Jesus, he left heaven to become human. We think of his death. And we think how extremely horrible it was. And yet for us, it was him paying our sacrifice for our sins. We think of his resurrection and how glorious it was. He conquered sin and the grave and death. And yet for some, for some it leaves them empty for their lack of a relationship with him. As we look at this passage in the Gospel of John, it's come to the end of Jesus' life. He's died, he's rose again. He's appeared a couple times to his disciples. And his disciples had been told to go to Galilee and he would meet them there. And for Peter, 
Peter, it had to seem kind of, oh. You know, he had been with Jesus three years, and it was great. He had seen him do these miracles, and he had walked on water himself. He had participated in the feeding of 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fishes. He had seen all the wonderful things Jesus had done. Seen him raise Lazarus from the grave. And then Jesus says, I'm going to go and die, and you're all going to forsake me. And Peter says, surely not I. Even if all the rest forsake you, I won't. When Jesus had asked, who is, who do people say that I am? They said, some say Elijah or one of the prophets. And he says, who do you say I am? And Peter had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It was a high point for Peter. And yet right after that, when Jesus talks of going to the cross, Peter says, never. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. For Peter, these three years were wonderful, and yet he saw his own weaknesses. And when he denied Jesus three times, he went out and he wept bitterly. Because he never thought he could do that. The one who was his savior. And now, after Jesus had risen, they're waiting to see him. And Peter becomes a little restless. And he thinks about how three years before he had been a fisherman. He enjoyed fishing. And he had been called from that work to be a fisher of men. And he missed it a bit. And he says, I'm going to go fishing. And the other disciple says, we'll go with you. And sometimes it's good. It's good to go and relax a bit, to do something you enjoy. You can focus a little better after you do that. Peter and the other disciples go fishing. And they fish all night. They give it their best. Catch nothing. Kind of frustrating, isn't it? When you give it your best and it seems like there's nothing there. You farm all year, no crop. Low prices. You work hard at a job only to have the job taken away. You're laid off. The business goes closed. And there's that sense of disappointment. And for Peter and the other disciples, fishing all night and catching nothing was a bit of a disappointment. And then there's a stranger standing on the shore and he calls to them, how'd you do? You catch any fish? No, we didn't catch nothing. We didn't catch anything. And he says to them, put your net on the other side of the boat. Put your net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch fish. How do you feel when somebody says that to you? How'd you do? How'd your corn do this year? How did your cattle do? Did you make any money? Sometimes we do, sometimes no. Well, you should plant this kind of seed. You should feed them this. You should do things different. And then things will go better for you. And the disciples had to think, put our net on the other side of the boat, not that far away. But what did they have to lose? They put their net on the other side of the boat and it becomes full. See, it wasn't so much that the net moved, but they listened to Jesus and Jesus filled the net. And we do well to listen to Jesus and his word to us the lives he calls us to live, the people he calls us to be. Because we can live life in the busyness of it and find no joy and satisfaction in living. 
And yet, when we know what Jesus is calling us to do, and we follow that path, we can have joy even in difficulty. Catching a net full of fish seemed great, and yet it's work. They were almost unable to haul them in. Getting a good crop seems great, and yet it's work. I remember years ago, we had a hailstorm come through, and it wiped out all our small grain ready to be harvested. A neighbor, Alvin Grunewig, looked at it on the bright side. He said, look at it this way. He said, when everybody else is out there harvesting that dusty oats, we can go fishing. (laughs) And we think of our lives. And they're gifts to us from God, are they not? And whether we're working hard or playing, we should see it as a gift from God. An opportunity to give him thanks for what he's done for us. And yet we realize all that we have is a gift from God. And John, when the net is full of fish, he right away realizes it's the Lord. Only Jesus could have done this for them. And he says it's the Lord, and Peter right away is excited, puts on his robe which he had taken off, and he dives into the water and swims about 100 yards to shore and greets Jesus while the rest of them come behind in the boat with the fish, and Jesus is making breakfast for them. And it had to seem like this is really good. We're back to the good old days again. Jesus is with us, and he's serving us food. And they had to feel really good about themselves. Jesus came back to them. And all was good until Jesus started talking. Talking particularly to Peter. And he says to him, Peter, do you truly love me more than these? More than all these fish? This experience? More than the other disciples? More than your family? Do you love me more than the rest of life? And Peter says to him, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him, take care of my sheep. Amazingly, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And Jesus was calling Peter back to be the leader of the church. He calls sinners such as us to repentance. He calls us to serve him. He uses us. But Jesus repeats it to Peter just a bit differently. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? An agape love. You love me with everything. Yes, Jesus, you know that I love you, Peter replies. And Jesus says, Feed my sheep. And again, Jesus repeats it to him. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Not truly love me, but do you love me? It's a falape type of love, a brotherly type of love. Do you even do that, Peter? And Peter is frustrated because he realizes he's just been asked three times. Do you love Jesus? He reminded that he denied him three times. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. After all, I went with you for three years. I spent three years of my life with you. You know that I love you. And Jesus says to him, take care of my lambs. Take care of the church. Take care of people following me. And see, it's easy for us to focus on ourselves, is it not? 
it's easy for us to take confidence in who we are. And yet our only confidence is in who Christ is and who he calls us to be. And he calls us to be his followers. And he calls us to take care of his sheep, to feed his sheep, the people of this world. Do we love Jesus? Then we want to teach our children to love Jesus. We want to teach them that their identity is in that Jesus loves them. And so we teach them from a very young age, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We find our confidence in knowing that Jesus loves us. He loves us so much he came to this world to suffer and die for us that we can be part of the family of God for all eternity. He calls us to be people who find our identity in the love of Christ. And having experienced that love, we live life in that joy. Whether we're working hard at some menial task which we wished we didn't have to do, whether we're working on equipment, sometimes we cut our hands, we put in long hours, we sweat over what we do to make a living for our children. We have the joy of doing work, whether it be menial tasks or whether it be something we find total joy in some glorious thing. We do it serving Jesus who came to serve us. And yet sometimes it's easy for us to look around, is it not? Jesus told Peter, I tell you the truth. You used to do what you wanted to do. You were in charge when you were putting your boat in the water. You went where you wanted but now you're going to get in my boat. And people are going to take you where you don't want to go. And you're going to end up dying like I did. Being crucified on a cross. You denied me when I went to the cross. You will proclaim me when you die a death serving me. And Peter was willing to do that. But he looks... And John is following him. It's easy for us to look around, is it not? At our lives and the lives we're living. And we look at the lives of our neighbors, our classmates. And Peter says, but Lord, what about him? What's he going to have to do? I'm doing this. What are they going to do? And Jesus says, if I want him to live until I return, what is that to you? What difference does it make? I've called you to follow me. And you are blessed to be my disciple. And Jesus says the same to us. When we look around and compare our lives to others, oftentimes we compare ourselves to those who seem to have it better than we do. Seldom do we look at those who are going through extreme difficulty. But Jesus says to us, what is that to you? If somebody else seems to have a life of ease, we're called to follow. And it's a privilege. Whether you're going through something that is very enjoyable or something that's very difficult. When we focus on Jesus, it makes all the difference. And sometimes Jesus uses that difficult time in life to be the greatest blessing for us because it's then we know how much we need him. Sometimes going through the death of a loved one, it's very difficult. And yet we can find joy in it. 
knowing that our loved one is in a far better place. I remember a number of years ago visiting with a lady whose husband was in the nursing home and he was on his last days and she had a very hard time letting him go until he turned to her and said, you know, if heaven is such a wonderful place, why do you want to keep me here? And we think about what Jesus did for us. He came and died for us that we can have eternal life. He prepared a mansion for us. And we have much to anticipate. Sometimes we focus more on our problems here in this life than we do on Jesus and what he's done for us. Oftentimes we have to look back and see that God used that difficult time even for our good. There's a story of a farmer who used an old horse to till his fields. One day, the horse escaped into the hills. When the farmer's neighbors sympathized with the old man over his bad luck, the farmer replied, bad luck, good luck, who knows? A week later, the horse returned with a herd of horses from the hills. This time, the neighbors congratulated the farmer on his good luck. His reply was, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Then the farmer's son was attempting to tame one of the wild horses. He fell off its back and broke his leg. Everyone thought this was very bad luck. The farmer's reaction was, bad luck, good luck, who knows. Some weeks later, the army marched into the village and selected every able-bodied youth they found there to be part of the army. When they saw the farmer's son with his broken leg, they let him off. Was it good luck? Or bad luck. Only God. And we as people who believe in God, who trust in the providence of God, do not believe in luck. We believe all things are under his care. And the Heidelberg Catechism puts it this way. What do you understand by the providence of God? And the answer is, providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. And how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? And the answer is, we can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing will separate us from his love. All creatures are so completely in his hand that, that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. How blessed we how blessed we are to have a God who's in control and a God who loves us and our children. May we live this day in joy, knowing his love and sharing it. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this day. And Lord, we confess we like to be people who are in control. We like to have control of our finances, our family, our health. And yet, Lord, we know that you are ultimately in control. You call us to be faithful people. But you make things work out for good to those who love you. And Lord, we confess it's easy for us to doubt 
when things seem to be difficult. Lord, give us grace. Give us grace to trust you. That even in our failings, you use them to point us to you. That we need you as our Savior and Lord to save us from our sins. And it's only you who can do that. Lord, we thank you that you call us. You call us to be your disciples. Help us, Lord, to appreciate that call. To see it as an honor to serve you as we serve those around us. Lord, may you be glorified in us, your people. For the sake of Jesus Christ. And now let us stand and profess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and while our offerings are being received, we'll sing number 495, Jesus Loves Even Me. I am so Father in heaven, we come unto you in this morning, and Lord, we thank you for blessing us so richly, for giving us far more than we need or deserve, far more than many others throughout the world. And Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to give back a portion of what you've entrusted to our care, and we ask that you will multiply, that you will use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, that you will use it to feed your sheep, your children your people you've called to follow you. 
And Lord, may you be glorified through what we give. We ask this in Jesus' name. And for our benediction this morning, we turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, where Paul writes these words, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. For our closing song this morning, we sing number 92, Oh, how I love